What are you doing? Just hanging, man. I miss you so much, bro. Did you I get my video? So Did you get yeah, Alien on video? It. Yes. You did? That's good. So you I know think my I was supposed to be going on, I was supposed to be going on, uh, like, doing, going live with Judah as he did, you know, preach the gospel. But um, I'm not sure if uh, I missed it or not. I think I might have gotten it. I'm wrong, and now he doesn't seem to be. Hey, can you do another um, The Floor is Lava video tonight? Okay, will you do one? <laughs> I mean, I'm not as creative or as athletic as you. Well, you should do it anyway, though. I'll do one, but yours was... Masterful last night. Thanks, man. I got a, I got a lot of good feedback for that. <laughs> Things awesome. I feel like you could make him even crazier. Like you're walking yeah. on foam rollers. We literally <laughs> we didn't take much time with it. Like we set that up in like 15 minutes, and that was pretty much it. See if you can um surf downstairs or something. I tried to like just incorporate the stairs, but. It, it wasn't gonna happen. It just was too dangerous. So I was trying to put stuff there. And it was just like I don't want to. I don't want to like hurt myself for the amusement for others. You know what I mean? Like, that's <laughs> not my goal. But, I miss you so bad. Miss you, bro. You been feeling good lately? Yeah, it's kind of a crazy time, obviously, but we are quarantined in the house with the boys. Doing good. Yeah. Nice. How are you feeling? Uh, I feel good, man. I feel really good. I feel really good. People are like Love expecting you. me to do like I, I posted that I was doing church right now, and it's like they're like expecting me to have church. So it's like you and I, you and I are just like on chat, like not even doing anything to do with church. Give us a little. Give us a little. Give us a little. Uh, five minute. Who is who is Jesus? What's the gospel like to you? Like, what is what is the gospel? In what is the gospel? Minutes, give me five minute gospel preaching. Go. The gospel is the good news, and the good news of Jesus is that all of us uh, were born broken. We're all we all have a sense and a desire for God. We all have a hole in our soul. Um, I think it's in moments like this that we're all aware of that hole. We all miss each other. We all miss life and purpose and um, humanity's broken, but Jesus came to fill the hole. And so what we believe is we believe that Jesus is God's son, that he came to this world in the form of a man and that he uh, lived a spotless and perfect life. And essentially he became the atoning sacrifice. That's a churchy word, but he paid the price for our sin because he was the only sacrifice that was worthy to pay the price. He lived perfect. So he went to a cross and his blood was shed. And we believe that if we put our trust in him, that because of his sacrifice, because of his death, that he paid our punishment, that we don't have to fear the wrath of God or the anger of God because of our imperfection or sin, but rather because of Jesus' sacrifice, we put our trust in him and that he didn't just die, but he, he resurrected. And so um, every Sunday we gather to preach that message and remind ourselves that we have a God who loves us so much that he was willing to die for us. And the fact that he resurrected means that he's alive today and that he wants to, his spirit wants to live through us. And so every day we're empowered by his grace to go after our purpose and into our future. And so, um, yeah, anyone who's watching right now, we just want to let you know that God loves you. God is for you. God's not mad at you. God already, yeah, if anyone's ever told you God's going to punish you, he, he already punished Jesus. And so our message is really one of belief, one of trust. Uh, one of knowing that God's love is, is greater than any mistake we've ever made. And I think for you and me and for so many others, we find such strength in surrender to him. I don't think God's looking for our strength. I think he's looking for our surrender. Mm -hmm. And today I was preaching to our church on the gratitude effect, that in times like this, in our darkest moments, uh, we can always still be grateful for what Jesus essentially has done for us. And um, we're preaching at home right now about the days leading to the cross before Jesus got to the cross and what he did on Monday, what he did on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because Easter's coming up. And so uh, I was teaching on the Passover day, the, the last supper meal. And at the last supper, he broke bread and he gave thanks. 
And I believe that he was giving us a principle that in our hardest moments, our most challenging moments, we can still give thanks. Because when we give thanks, uh, essentially we're living a life of gratitude. And gratitude is the thing that we need, I think, in moments like this because it gives us a bigger perspective. It helps us step into the future uh, confident of what God has already done in the past and what he'll do again in the future. So those are some of my thoughts. Do do you think – so – you you would say that we don't need to like earn God's love for us. Like no. we don't need to do good things to earn God's love. We could never do enough good things. You know what I mean? That's 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 the whole point of what I think we're preaching every week is that there's no way to earn it. You couldn't do enough good things to be good enough, and you can't do enough bad things to be bad enough. It literally comes down to trust and belief in what He's done for us, and that's that's the way that we respond to Him. Is that he, that the fact that He paid the price we just simply believe and as we believe it's right believing that leads to right living so no you can't earn it how how come how come you can't do enough good things because a lot of people would say like because it's like this i'm a good person and so a lot of people would say like i'm a good person like so what would what would you say to that person who says well i i'm a good person i do good and yada 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 yeah, I think that doing good is, once again, parts of doing good at times can be subjective because you can do good with the wrong intentions, and is that good? But ultimately, I think that God, his standard, the scripture says that all have fallen short of the glory of God, and the glory of God being the standard of his perfection. So a really basic analogy is if God's perfect, let's say perfect is the moon, and let's say we're trying to jump to the moon. Well, You know, LeBron James can definitely jump higher than me, but if the goal is the moon, he's not jumping that much higher than me. He's still a long way off. And so I think with our good deeds, there's no way we can be perfect. We've we've had bad thoughts. We've done evil things. Our motivations at times are corrupt. Why we do what we do. And um, that's why we need grace because grace is is the bridge from us to the moon. Yeah. So what is grace? Grace, by definition, is the unmerited favor of God. Uh, a good way of saying it is that grace is, uh, is God's empowerment on our lives, and grace is, the, grace is the bridge from us to God. It's, it's, the only way we could get there is by God giving us favor, is by God saying, you know what, I'm not going to judge you by your actions. I'm going to love you in spite of you, despite of you, like... I'm a broken human being. And the thing about receiving grace is acknowledging that. It's simply going, yo, I don't have it all together. I've got brokenness. I've missed the mark. I'm not perfect. And I'm in need of God's grace. And grace by definition is the fact that God, not based upon my merit, grants me favor, grants me acceptance, grants me approval uh, because of the sacrifice once again of Jesus, that Jesus paid the price for all of our mistakes. And so, with that being said, um, is that why, so that's, that's what you'd say, that's why we need Jesus, because what he's done is he, he took the punishment so that, that is the grace. So what he did is he took the punishment himself so that we don't have to live in shame and fear and, you know, um, yes. being not good enough, because like, Ultimately, everybody's striving to like be, you know, to be good. Everybody wants, you know, there's, you know, for the majority, I feel like people, you know, are striving to be the best versions of themselves. And, you know, they do that in different ways, whether it's, you know, like, you know, being the best at what they do in their career or, you know, trying to be the kindest they can to people or nice to people. But like you're saying, people just miss the mark. No matter how good you try to be, you're not going to be perfect. And so that's why, you know, Jesus sent his perfect son who knew no sin, became sin so that we could become right with God because sin separated us with God. Am I correct? Absolutely. And it does. Sin is a wall between us and God. And that's why we, that's why we pray to Jesus. We thank God for Jesus because it's his sacrifice, it's his death, it's his punishment that unseparates us, that opens the line up. Not because God is a bad God, because God is perfect and we are not. And perfection can't have imperfection. And so Jesus is the bridge. So when God says don't do things, he's not saying it to be this guy who's like, you know, I'm setting rules and if you do this, you're a bad person. God's basically saying 
don't do these things because I want you to have the most full life you can possibly live. And this is yeah. actually going to make your life worse. Not, it's not because he wants to be this God that's like, you know, don't do this. You're, you know, like, and be this like fun police, right? Is that what you'd say? I totally believe it that way. I think that God, he has different principles and different rules, whatever words you want to use. And I, I, I tend to think of God's rules as like guardrails. And it's yeah. like, can you drive on the highway without guardrails? For sure. But it's not recommended. What ends up happening is that guardrails are there for your safety, for your protection, to help yeah. keep you aligned. And I think that so much of God's word, the Bible, is helping us get from point A to point B in the safest, uh, most effective way. And so whether that's our relationships, whether that's our families, whether that's how we conduct business, whether that's our personal lives, it's not God saying, let me limit your life. It's like God saying, I actually have the best plan for your life. And if you'll trust me and if you'll obey me, uh, I'm going to lead you from point A to point B, the most efficient and effective and healthiest way. So, yeah, I don't think that God's up there trying to be mean or slow us down. I think that God has a beautiful plan for everybody and a beautiful purpose. But we so often trust ourselves more than what we trust him. It always comes back to trust, doesn't it? Like, do I trust God? Like, <laughs> Do I trust God? And many times trusting God in the short term is very difficult. In the long term, it leads to a better, beautiful life. But, but sin is always e easy in the short term, but it always hurts you in the long term. It's like I'm just learning this all the time, whether it's, you know, eating a DiGiorno pizza right now is going to taste good going down, but it's not going to maybe produce uh, the body, the life, the health that I want. That's how sin works, I think, so often. That's how we break God's parameters. It maybe feels good temporarily, but it doesn't produce – what I'm looking for, purpose, um, confidence. Instead, it produces shame, guilt, regret, pain, heartache, addiction. So God's so for people. God loves people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is good stuff, man. It's powerful. I love you. A lot of people are, a lot of people, I mean, I know that I had for a while, but like you put God in this, you know, category of this box that you feel like, you know, God is this superior thing in this, like, you know, that is like, when I do something bad, he's like, you know, basically disappointed in us, you know? And like, so we do something bad and we like sit in this shame where God's saying, you know what, like, he's like, every time we fall, he wants to pick us back up. And it's like how, you know, you know, a moment, what was that story with Peter on the water? Was it Peter yeah. that walked out to Jesus and he fell in the water? Yep. You know, when he fell in, when his faith got low, Jesus didn't shame him. He picked him back up, right? Yep. So I think that's a good picture to like, you know, it's just a great picture that Jesus, when we, when we lose faith, when we do something that isn't, you know, necessarily the best for us, God isn't like, you know, you're a bad person who's basically like, I want to, you know, keep going. I love you. I already paid the price for that. Don't wallow in that sin and shame. But the devil wants us to sit in that, right? And he Absolutely. wants us to wallow in that shame. The scripture says that the righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. And I've always loved that verse because you think if someone falls seven times, that would make them not righteous. But it's the act actually the opposite. Our righteousness is always about us running back to the Father. And yeah. you know, in the scriptures, you never can find in the scriptures like a picture of Jesus running. Like Jesus was never in a hurry. He was relaxed. He was yeah. patient. He was walking. Yeah, the only trying time to make I, his babies and stuff. Yeah, the, the only time I can find um, God running is in that story of the prodigal son. When the son turns back, the father, who's a picture of our heavenly father, he runs towards the son. And yeah. I've always just loved that concept that when you turn towards God, God runs towards you. When yeah. you turn towards God, God is running towards humanity. And it's, yeah. it's just to your point that, yeah, don't stay in shame. Don't, don't beat yourself up. God, God's not beating you up. Jesus already paid the price. It's about quickly turning to the Father and, and asking for his help again. I, I need grace right now. Even in the midst of my mistake, I need grace today. I need grace yesterday. I need grace tomorrow. I need grace five years from now. So we continue to speak that out and we continue to surrender to God. That's awesome. What would you, what would you, um, what was basically your sermon today about, or what were you preaching on that, um, that your guys or your church were talking about today? Yeah, I'm just looking at this story in Matthew 26 where 
literally it's it's the it's the story of Jesus before he gets um, betrayed in the garden. He's with his disciples, and they're going to have the Last Supper meal. And there's a lot of just cool um, stuff in the text about the, the disciples didn't have a plan for the Passover meal, and Jesus he still had a plan. I, I like that idea. I, I preached on that a little bit today, just about the idea that like God's got solutions to problems you don't even know exist, and maybe you weren't planned for this problem, but but Jesus already has a plan. I just I love that idea of the sovereignty of God that although the disciples didn't prepare for the Passover meal, which is a big deal, Jesus still already had a plan and a solution to it. But ultimately, the crux of the message was just landing on that point that, you know, hours before Jesus is going to die, he's still taking time to, to give thanks. And I titled the message, The Gratitude Effect, The Effects of Gratitude. And I said that gratitude protects your perspective. I said gratitude focuses your future. I said gratitude gravitates towards, ge towards generosity. And lastly, that gratitude attracts the right attention. And so I think right now- Go to that time first one, what was the first one? It protects your perspective. Like, so gratitude protects your perspective. I wanna just stop there for a second because that's gonna help a lot of people. Um, uh, well, first and foremost, like I've been at this, first of all, like I'm so blessed, like, God has blessed me with so many, so much amazing, just so many amazing things, gifts, abilities, um, this home. And, you know, there's a lot that we can stress out about, whether it's the coronavirus or, and not that it's something to just push to the side. It's a big deal. But like, you know, um, there's just so many little things like I that we can be grateful for just breath in our lungs being able to walk and talk and breathe and you know i think like like you said that gratitude perspective uh, it, it protects your perspective when your perspective is you know man i'm not going to get back you know i'm not going to get back to work i'm going to lose all this money today um or this week or whatever it is you're still you still have like that perspective so what was the second one you said gratitude focuses your future Gratitude is your future. Can you uh, expand on that one too, a little bit? Yes. So I, th I, think, I think the first one is all about that beautiful idea of what you're saying right there, which is like, we don't see the world for how the world is. We see the world for how we are. So if I'm unhealthy, I'm going to view the world, even beautiful things, in a toxic way. So gratitude helps protect the way I'm viewing the world currently right now today. Secondly, Gratitude focuses my future. And what that tells me is, is that when I live a thankful life, what I'm doing is, is that I'm reminding myself that life isn't just about who I am today. Life is really about who I'm becoming tomorrow. And it's really the motto that you and I and so many of our friends live by, which is better at 70, which is I'm not just going to be defined by today, but I'm actually living for a legacy. Um, I'm living not just for an income, I'm living for an impact. And it's about not just what I'm creating today, but what I'm going to leave here on this earth. And so whenever I live grateful, whenever I'm, I express gratitude, when I'm thinking grateful, it puts me into a much bigger story than just my own story. It puts me into the God story. And, and I think, I think, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but no, I, 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 so just, I wanted to share something real quick because I'm thinking like, if, if you, it's so hard to see the greatness or like, obviously I'm able to see all these amazing things that's God, that God's given me. But one perspective that I really got from Judah that was really cool is that when Jesus healed that dude who was paralyzed and he said, your sins are forgiven, right? Was he paralyzed? Yeah. That's the guy. Yeah. The, when he yeah, said that, that, he didn't go right and heal him, right? He, he told him his sins are forgiven to let him know that the most important thing for that guy to be grateful for is not that, you know, he's alive or whatever, whatever, he, th that his soul, his anchor for his soul was actually, you know, he was, he was forgiven. Like, and so like, for me, I think the perspective of like a lot of people don't have hope. It's hard for people to see the, the goodness of what's going on because they don't have an anchor for their soul first. And so I think like having that hope for your soul to know that I'm forgiven, I'm going to live for eternity. I mean, that's, that's big stuff. Totally. And I think that that story that you're referencing, which is such a powerful point to make, it's like, what good is it to have help, you know, to have working legs, but to have a broken soul? You know what I mean? So 
it's like Jesus could heal his broken legs, but that would be a temporary miracle. The real miracle was the fact that he forgave him. And the real miracle was that he gave him salvation, which is the eternal future. It's not about just the here and now. So I fully agree. Because you're no longer worrying about like death so much. I mean, death is such a scary thing. A lot of people are afraid of death. And as, as someone who believes in Jesus and believes that when you die, you get eternal life. Eternal life in heaven is supposed to be this perfect euphoric place. And so death is actually graduation. And, but, but in order to have that perspective, obviously that takes faith, right? I mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, to be absent, the, the bodies be present with, with the Lord. And so for Christians, we're not living life for simply uh, happily ever after. We're living life for something much bigger than that, which is heaven ever after. And we have an eternal perspective. And that's the best news that no matter what we face, um, the scripture says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And that doesn't just mean simply for the here and now. That means that even if I die by the coronavirus, I didn't prosper because I'm going to spend eternity with jesus you know and uh exactly. if life exactly. ends for me today paul said to live as christ to die is gain well how was he able to say such an extreme statement to die is gain yeah it's because he's echoing right now we're echoing what the point you're, it's a graduation that we're going to spend forever with our with our savior and that's a very comforting point and a comforting truth in this time right now that as believers we don't have to be wayward or operate in fear we can remind ourselves that we're living for something so much greater than right now today or the next 30 years. The, the idea of, you know, and I'll hear Judah talk about it. And he says, like, we actually believe in immortality, which is which for people to like hear. And it's just kind of a crazy concept. I never really thought about that. Like, we believe in immortality. Like, we actually believe that you know, our spirits actually never die. I just thought, I don't know, I just thought that was such a cool thought, like, um, way to put it. Like, we believe in immortality. Like, God, we go, we go to heaven, and it's like this marvelous, amazing place. I don't know, I just, it's, it's such a, it is. It's, it's really, it's, it's just like, it's so, my spirit just feels, like, I just feel like an ease. There's so much going on right now that I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I don't know what's going on with tour. I don't know what's going on in, like, with my near future, but I do know that I, my, my future is secure, knowing that I'm forgiven, I'm saved, I'm set free from my past. I don't have to live in sin or in shame. I can live free. Um, and that is so rewarding, knowing that like my past doesn't define me. I am, you know, I'm forgiven. I'm, you know, I'm right with God. And so when that time comes, when, you know, when and if, you know, the world ends or if you know if the worst the worst comes to worst you know i know that my faith is you know i'm i'm right with god and that's a, such a rewarding feeling it's a very it's rewarding a safe, feeling and such a safe feeling it's a very safe feeling and the encouraging thing is, is that it's available to all so anybody who's even listening Everybody. right now or watching this they right now in a moment can have that exact same security it doesn't mean that you don't have fears. It doesn't mean that you don't go through times of uncertainty. It just reminds you that when the storm comes, you've built your life on something more solid than this world. There's a lot of things that we don't know today, but there's so many things because of Christ that we do know. We know that God is for us. We know that God loves us. We know that Jesus has saved us. We know that we're right with God. We know that if we were to die today, that we can have confidence in the fact that we'll spend eternity with him. And you know the truth go to, of i'm going is, back i just want to go back on what you touched on a second ago because you're so right yeah. when people so many people especially in you know they're in a lot of uh you know um different churches or people christians around the world have made it seem like you know whether it's like you have to go to a pastor to you know be connected to be closer to god or you need to like you need to do something special to be you know close to God or whatever it is. And, and, and the truth is, is that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter, you know, how bad you think you are, no matter how messed up you think your life is, God, first of all, isn't afraid of your mess. He's not ashamed of your, what you've done. He wants you to come to him with open arms and um, just accept what he's done for you. And sorry, I, 
it exit out. Right, my back. You're there, yeah. And he's and and God is like so. He's just for us, no matter what we've done. And it's just like if you, if any of you on the internet, anybody watching, wants to have a relationship with God or with Jesus, it's as simple as just saying, Jesus. I accept what you did for me on the cross. I believe you are, are the son. Of, I believe you are God. And, um, you know, I ask that you forgive me for, from, you know, for my sins. And, you know, I want to, and, and that's, I mean, would you, would you say that that's, that's it, right? It's confess with your yeah, mouth. The scripture and says, yeah. yeah. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Yet to all who received him, he gave them the right to be called children of God. It's about receiving and believing in Jesus. That's the starting point. That's awesome. That's so Beautiful. awesome. So amazing. It's really awesome, man. For, bro, there's nothing better. There's really nothing better than a t life in, with eternity with our creator. Amen. Amen. There really isn't. There's nothing better. There's no better feeling. No so better I'm really feeling. grateful. Thank you for chatting with me, bro. I really appreciate you. I love you so much, bro. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and I know a lot of people are going to be encouraged by this. Amen. You're the best. I can't wait till this is over. I'm going to come hug you. Yeah. Okay. I love you. I love you so much, man. You're the best. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.